Okay, so heretofore I've been talking principally about naturalism. I want to turn now to say at least a little bit about the other half of the formula which I introduced at the beginning of this lecture, um, uh, and that's about the question of, uh, of, of, uh, of scientific realism. Um, there, there's been a question which has sort of been running through the, the, the courses I've been uh, talking about so far, but I haven't really directly explicitly addressed it, and that's the question about whether or not science describes the quote-unquote real world. Now, I think if you ask most people, most scientists this question, they're going to give a common sense answer, which is to say, of course it does. Well, what else is science studying? Um, uh, that, that's science is ultimately about the real world. It's trying to describe and make sense of the real world. But you may not have noticed, if, again, if you have been following along so far, that basically all of the major positions I've been looking at in this series actually answer this question in the negative. They are, uh, not a single one of the major positions I've addressed is going to say that science actually is about describing the real world. Start with the logical positivists. The logical positivists re totally rejected the idea of a quote-unquote real world. That sounds to them like metaphysics. No, you, you, there are no depths in nature, uh, according to the positivists. All, there is just surface. There is the way the world appears. There is no real world beneath those appearances. Karl Popper thought that science, again, was, was sort of trying to describe the real world, but because of the nature of falsificationism, it can never actually do that. Uh, you can never really be sure that your scientific ideas have actually described the, the real world. All you can say is that your, your scientific theories have not yet been falsified, but that's, that, that doesn't mean that what you're actually talking about when you're doing science actually is the real world. Thomas Kuhn rejected scientific realism because he thought that, that, that uh, our experience is always too deeply mediated by any particular paradigm, and that paradigm is going to fundamentally separate us from the real world in any interesting way. Uh, so again, it's not to say that there is no such thing as the real world, and it's not to say that science isn't informed by the real world, but at the end of the day, the role of the paradigm simply puts too much distance between that real world and us. Uh, now, the most obvious examples, of the course, are like the strong program in sociology and the postmodernists. They're going to say, yeah, this, this so-called real world is just a social construct. That what you call the real world isn't really real in any deep or meaningful or profound sense. It's all just sort of a collective delusion, as it were. So if all of these positions reject the idea that science is about describing the real world, maybe it makes sense to try to go back and take a look at some of these sort of problems from, the, from a realist point of view. What would a philosophy of science that actually is realistic in nature, that, 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 that says the job of science is to describe the real world, look at? look like. And probably the best way to see this is by going back to the problem I discussed several times already, this notion of the theory-ladenness of observation. This, I think, is in many ways the pr one of the principal roadblocks to scientific realism. Uh, if indeed our observation of the world is fundamentally conditioned by theory, then again, it might seem as though theory creates a gulf between the, the so-called real world and us that may be unbridgeable. Now, the theory ladenness of observation has been a major theme in post kuhnian philosophy of science, but it comes in a variety of different degrees. Now, some of these, I think, are fairly uncontroversial, fairly innocuous. I think everyone's going to agree, for example, that theory guides observation. Your theory tells you, you know, that this might be a good experiment, but that probably won't be a good experiment. That, that, that kind of thing is not controversial at all. If all we mean by the theory ladenness of observation is that theory guides observation, then that's not going to be a terribly big problem. But other versions of the theory ladenness of observation are much more extreme. Uh, so, for example, you know, remember um, uh, um, Paul Feyerabend said it's not just that theory guides observation. He said theory dictates observation. Your theory tells you what you can see, according to Feyerabend, and that's a very extreme version of this view. And of course, there's also in between views. There's there's you know not mild, not extreme, but maybe moderate views that say things like, for example, that theory infects observation language. You cannot talk about what you're seeing without using the, uh, the some sort of theoretical language. You can see things without the, uh, the, uh, appealing to theory necessarily, but you cannot characterize them. That's sort of a more moderate version of this uh, of this position. Now, the exact extent of, of this problem for a naturalist philosophy of science is going to vary depending on exactly which of these three varieties of the theory ladenness of observation it is that we're talking about. Now, one of, I think, the sort of most helpful ways of seeing past the theory ladenness of observation 
comes from the philosopher of science Jerry Fodor, who wrote an article titled Observation Reconsidered, in which he tried to sort of uh, throw this idea of the, uh, of, of, of the sort of stronger versions of the theory ladenness of observation for a loop and try to show that the stronger versions are simply not very tenable. Uh, and the way he did this was by arguing that some theories are going to impact our observations in some ways, but other theories actually don't impact our observations at all. Some observations actually are pretty much more or less theory independent. And one of the great ways of seeing this is by looking at the phenomena of optical illusions. Now, I, I, I talked about, about optical illusions before in this context to try to, to try to demonstrate the theory ladenness of observation. So I showed this picture right here, again, the, the picture of the old woman and the young girl, right? I, I, I said that, look, if I tell you I'm about to show you a picture of a young woman and I show you this picture, the first thing you will probably see is a young woman. Whereas if I tell you it, it's, a, it's an old woman, the first thing you'll probably see is the is the old woman, uh, and then if I sort of I can use this sort of theoretical framing as a priming device to push you one way or the other. This is a good example of how theory can influence observation. What you see is conditioned by what how you think about what you're going to see, but at the same time, not all. Uh, 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 the illusions work in this fashion. In fact, some illusions, some of the best illusions, defy our visual senses even when we know they are illusions. We cannot talk ourselves out of them. We just have to see the, uh, them in this uh, illusory way. So one, one, an excellent illustration of this, I think, is this optical illusion right here. Um, now, these two towers, again, it, 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 I think this, this one actually won an award a few years back for being one of the best ob ob optical illusions. Now, if you see this the way I do, and apparently the way most people do, the tower on the right looks like it's leaning out further than the tower on the left. But in point of fact, this is, these two pictures are 100% identical. Uh, this is two copies of the exact same picture. But somehow, because of the way our eyes work about lines of perspective, uh, we sort of naturally see the tower on the right as pulling more to the right and the tower on the left being a little bit more straight. Hopefully you see that the same way I do. Um, uh, uh, if not, then this example probably won't have much traction, but I do think most people do see this right away. Um, and here's the thing. is You can take out a, a measuring stick if you want. You can uh, look at these two pictures. You can overlay them. You can prove to yourself that these are the exact same picture. But try as you might, you cannot help but see that right tower as pulling further to the right than it actually is. The theory does not change the observation. The theory says these two things are identical, but the observation still sees them as different. Despite the fact that we know the trick, we cannot see past it. So this is an example, and it's the kind of example that Fodor talks about, that shows that theory does not always overpower observation. Sometimes observation is just intractable. Now, there's some pretty serious implications for the theory ladenness of observation from Fodor's critique. If theory, if Feyerabend was right, if theory dictates perception, then the second we know that something is an illusion, the second we know something is a trick, it should shatter that illusion, and we should see it through the sort of theoretical lens that we now understand. But that just isn't the way a lot of these illusions work. Sometimes our th theories have absolutely no effect at all on our perceptions. Go back yet again to what I opened up with the class with, right? We uh, uh, Theory tells us that all physical objects are 98% empty space. My bust of Albert Einstein is mostly empty space, according to theory. But we can't help but see it as solid, as, as, as just continuous. Now, ultimately, this doesn't eliminate the problem of the theory lateness of observation, but it does limit it. It restricts it. It shows it's not as big a problem as someone like Paul Feyerabend would have you believe. Now, this is sort of going to help a sort of broadly empiricistic approach, something that the logical positivist I think would have applauded Fodor here. He's not, Fodor isn't pushing for positivism, uh, but it, it at least sort of pushes us back in their direction. Empiricism is going to carry a little bit more weight in the light of Fodor's critique uh, because the, the theory ladenness of observation is now mitigated. Uh, this is not as big a problem as it was. Uh, now, paradoxically, this actually can create problems for empiricism in a variety of other ways. Uh, empiricism says, for example, that experience is primary and theory is secondary. But uh, this example does sort of show that at least some observations are subordinate to theory. Uh, now, 
uh, in short, what it shows is that there's sort of a fluid relationship here. Sometimes theory dominates, sometimes observations dominate, and these things can shift back and forth depending on context. Uh, so there is no sort of straightforward, simple re reductionistic approach in which you can say that, that fundamentally theory is, is, is foundational and, uh, or uh, experience is foundational. Uh, and again, that's just sort of the whole point about naturalism. We should expect an organic relationship between the two. Now, in, in some, I think the naturalists are going to see this as a win. This is going to be a, a win for naturalism. Observation, after all, is a natural phenomenon. Uh, when human beings observe the world, they're not doing something supernatural. They're not doing something that transcends the underlying laws of science that the, the govern and dictate everything. Uh, observation isn't mystical. It shouldn't be treated as something that's fundamentally different. Uh, observation is a phenomenon, and can, that can, accordingly, it can be studied by science. We can understand how observation works by using science. The kind of armchair reflections that old school philosophers have, have made about the nature of observation, you know, the old empiricist people like John Locke, for example, uh, they're probably not going to be worth a whole heck of a lot. You know, they may have been good at their time, but now we can start using, again, the tools of empirical science to have a better understanding of how exactly observation works, what it's good at, and what its limitations are. Peter Godfrey Smith outlines two sets of questions that are relevant here. First off, to what extent is observation reliable? That is to say, can we use observations to get fundamental, absolute, universal, end-all, be-all truths about the world? Or maybe more modestly, can we get at least lowercase t true beliefs about the world? Maybe they don't have to be fundamental and absolute necessarily, but they can at least be reliable enough to, to pass for true in a meaningful sense of the word. Second question, is observation neutral between competing theories? Uh, to use a word that I introduced when talking about Thomas Kuhn, maybe observation can be an intersubjective way of settling scientific disputes, of settling uh, uh, when you ha have two different theoretical uh, perspectives on something. Uh, maybe observations can be used not in an objective way, but at least in an intersubjective way. Now, what naturalism is going to say in this context is that we can use science to sort of bootstrap our way into sort of deeper and more profound answers about these questions. We take a first pass. Can observation settle uh, competing theories? Maybe it can't settle it necessarily completely, but maybe it can push us in one direction rather than another. And that once we're there, we can sort of reassess and come up with a new set of theoretical apparatus, which may then push, it, push us back to, one, to the original theory or further reinforce uh, the, the initial winning theory. Now, in particular, where some of the most interesting stuff is done is in the field known as evolutionary epistemology, which tries to sort of use understandings about how it is that the human brain evolved, and then, of course, understanding the, the tools of things like neuroscience, to get a better understanding of how it is that human beings come to know things. Uh, evolutionary epistemology is something that Quine was very interested in, and he, can, and he tries to sort of suggest that maybe uh, once we have, again, a, a sort of cognitive science-grounded epistemology and evolutionary-grounded epistemology, we can actually then, in turn, take those same tools to, and then go back and take a look at how scientific communities have dis disagreements. And maybe we can use these tools to then resolve disputes between scientific communities. It's not entirely clear this is going to work. Obviously, there's a lot of promissory notes going on here. But it's, in the very least, is a very promising research project to use. It's a, a, uh, a progressive research project, to use a term from Lakatos. Um, and it should be very exciting in, the, in the, the coming decades to see how cognitive science evolves and how it, it starts to expand into more philosophical domains.